little bit of my background, uh, how I came to this is I was in college in 1981, programming at PPL 34 to try to get the BT100 to do graphics. And it had a graphic character setting, so many of you may know this, and I made, a, I made an architectural layout program which is basic on that, but gee, you know, this is, I, I love the idea of a visual interface, and then the college had a copy of Popular Science or something that had a cover story on the Xerox Star, and I, I looked at that, and oh my god, pixels that you can address, a playground for the mind, you know, if this is what computing is about, I'm going into the field. So I went into the field, and in the mid-80s, I, I finished college at the University of Southern California, and I got a job. Uh, I went to this, this tiny company, garage company in German Oaks, and they had a Three Bridges Perk running something called Intran, which was this really, really high resolution, high definition document layout system. And the Perk was, you might, you might not know, was the first sort of commercial copy of an Alto. It was made in, in Three Rivers, it's made in Pittsburgh, trying to know the folks. And it was amazing. I mean, I, I now have one that runs the in, interest system. It's very flaky. Um, but it's, it, it, it just sort of blew me away. So things were going on in graphical interfaces, of course, long before that. But I got the chance to actually write a whole port, well, a recreation of what was on that high-end workstation to run on the XT, where we had a XT or AT, we had a Sigma displays monitor of 1600 by 1200 and 640K RAM, and I, my task that I was given was to create a star desktop type environment on that for Xerox for worldwide distribution, and I did it. I wrote it from scratch, and see, the people at Park Brown Bag, us, the icon work in a brown bag. We literally got this stuff in unlabeled bags that we took to our 6085, and we took all the icon work out of Park, and we remodified it, and we put it out, a document composed composition system, uh, on running on a standard platform to get it out of the 685 and star. And so I got my dream, my dream came true, which is I was able to address every pixel, I could start with a blank, white, you know, high resolution screen, high resolution, and the star, and I had to do the entire interface. The windowing, the pull downs, the whole bit from scratch, and make it look as good or better than the Xerox environment that Xerox sold worldwide. 120 countries, uh, and it still generates every phone bill you get, and your provider directories, and all those horrible things you hate comes out of that software. It's now, I, I moved to Czechoslovakia in 1990, we hired 55 engineers and ported it to Windows 3.0. And it actually is the sole surviving GUI from that entire Xerox era. And you'll be able to see uh, Don Woodward uh, uh, running it. Uh, he's got a network of 685s and 8090 server. Anyway, that's the preamble. Uh, so, getting, getting started here, it's uh, a little bit over already, but uh, we got the sound over. Uh, so this is a, a, a very, very quick zoom through the birth of the graphical interface from about the mid-60s and why we're sitting in front of certain machines that do certain, have certain looks and feels today, and that we're probably locked into that for the rest of our natural lives. Um, but where did it all come from? What, how did it bounce around between companies and between laboratories? Uh, one of the projects is the Digibar. The Digibar is sort of split. We've got 500 systems ranging from uh, Tony Ball's Cray one from Lawrence Berkeley Lab down to all kinds of hot ball things uh, in a barn with pigs, although the pigs are in another part of the barn. <laughs> uh, many of you have been there. But one of the main focus of the actual collection is to collect the stories. So it's like a research center where people come in, they are the subject of the research. And the systems are, our mode is really get the systems running so people can move them up and we start recording uh, on camera. And we spent a huge amount of effort on the website. This is one of the projects, which is an extension of the famous bushy tree diagram that ended around 1984. And a student and I, uh, a student, sort of, I guess, is becoming a student of computer history, we're just basically trying to fill this out. And we get so much input on this. This is on our website. And 
somebody who worked on Bravo has told us this is the line between Bravo X and Word must be picked because Charles Simeone left, took the team right to Microsoft to make Word. And the reason your Word files are so huge is because they use the Bravo technique of saving the entire data structure to disk so that it's fast to load. That's why Word files are going to be huge for about a thousand years. Uh, but that's a <laughs> that's right out of the book. So we're going to kind of trace through. Kind of going down through NLS here and pouring through STAR and trickling down into some of these little branches here. I'm not really going to treat much in the way of the, the workstation GUIs. I'm most mostly focused on the first of the peer GUIs. And I'm not going to really treat applications, I'm going to really treat operating systems. So, starting, um, where did this all start? Well, there was a young man in World War II shipping out for war as the war ended. Uh, Doug Engelbart, who was a radar operator, came back from uh, World War II and said, you know what, computers ought to have these visual things that I worked with during the Pacific Theater, which is radar, visual interface should be able to connect to the computer. And he pursued this vision doggedly against the incredibly skeptical, uh, most people who were skeptical in the field until he was able to get a laboratory together at at SRI in the 60s and start to, to realize this dream of having visual interfaces working uh, uh, with devices and interfaces. And this is the NLS system. This is sort of an earlier, I think 1966 or so. I'm not an expert on this. And then the 67 NLS, which had NLS for online system. And so here are the kind of basic components of his vision the mouse. Uh, a corded keyboard, which they call a key set, which allows you to do two handed operation. Well, what would be along this today, right? Menu selection kind of there in the mouse and the keyboard. So that's how it all came together. So they put all this together in a fantastic demo in a thousand seat auditorium at the Fall Joint Computer Conference in December 68. There's Doug there. Uh, actually, it's all projected on a huge screen, one of those early. Ways of projecting your. <laughs> <laughs> that was before spyware. That was before, yeah, the intr intrusion of the modern GUI to our lives. It's terrible. Okay, I just ruined the recording. Anyway, this is a. Uh, he's basically doing a demo uh, for the audience, and this is a colleague of me at SRI. In a window broadcasting it. You can't really see her, but this is a mouse cursor moving around. He's showing what a mouse is, and he's using a corner keyboard to select down tiers of menus, describing how they'll all be knowledge workers soon. And of course, it took a lot longer than he thought. So, I mean, zoom forward to the early 70s. Xerox fell off the research center established by Peter McCulloch and company in 1970 and given the mission to come up with an architecture for information. Is a wonderful generic kind of open ended statement. And one of the things that uh, they did was uh, they were hoisted, uh, systems were hoisted upon them by Xerox from the SDS Sigma uh, computers that said, Well, if you're our lab, you should use the, this company we just bought, and the department didn't want to use that. So I think they made, they uh, created a couple of computers of their own called the Max, which is called Max C, and there's a piece of that on the exhibit on the floor. Might be the only piece of them actually, I'm not sure. And then they basically said, well, you know, we need to, we need, we're supposed to do this architecture for information. We need to actually do it. And uh, Father Lamson put in a request in December 72 for just such a system that they thought they pulled together all the resources of the people at the lab, like Al and Robert Flagel, and all those folks, and, and all the skills and the lessons and the vision that they had for. For part, and so he made a requisition. And this is from his famous uh, memo that said basically why Alto. So it really describes, you know, 15 minute interim native with dynamic systems, which was Al K's idea of the vision. And so he outlined the characteristics. But basically, one of the most interesting things is excerpted. Uh, you know, here's all your basic stuff that we live in the world we live in today. A long while, like point to point packet network, that's Bob at Cass Ethernet coming in. Bob at uh, Metcalf and Mr. Bob, Dr. Bob. Coax cable 
with Sarah set up systems where, which has its own files. Because communication is done slowly from the interchange of shareable information, shed some light on the long you know, merits of this against time sharing. Uh, they, they, it was really beefed up, so the processing power was pretty was going to be pretty big in the system. Personal computing, you know, what demonstrate convincingly things on the outcome. You know, heavy list users. The list never actually ran on the Alto, which is a strange thing. It ran on the, on the D machine. And graphics, talking about, uh, you know, we can do some, some things with graphics. And they argued for a tall monitor. That's some of the things they argued for. The tall monitor, the RAM, cost uh, several, many thousands of dollars, but they, they assumed that their understanding of Moore's law that the RAM to drive all those pixels was brought by 1980 would be affordable to make such a system. And they talked about the, the mouse. And uh, this, these are all sort of the specifications for it. You know, hard drive, it was actually a removable hard drive you could take between Altos, something we don't really have today. Uh, anyway, and there's the raster display port that they can display is a 72 dots bridge, so you can handle the idea from that one to one to the type settings. So here is, here is running, this is a screenshot from Alpha's off site, but uh, here's the draw program running on the Alpha screen. And that was the new test bed. That was the test bed that allowed these guys to develop small talk and Ethernet and mail and all that wonderful stuff connected with laser printers, write music software, the whole bit. I have a part report on my bench uh, out there that gives, it shows you a lot of what the Alpha was about. And basically, Xerox, uh, you know, had a revolving door at park where they had people come in and out, in and out, in and out, tours and demos and teach out, and everybody came in and out of park, and we all know about that. And it was kind of a wonderful seeding ground for ideas and vision. And when Xerox was doggedly determined that we some parts of the arts to make a product, so the product that they came up with out of this uh, was the the, the so-called D machines. And I actually have the first. A piece of, we have the John Wicks Dolphin, the D0, which was a handmade, unloved, uh, big, ugly beige box that was the first machine in the series that led to the Gerardo and then you know, on through, up to the Dandelion, the famous Xerox Star. And if you look at this, the wire wrapping of this thing is really scary. And they, they were so unreliable that they just got hoisted off on students. But, um, <laughs> The one that we have at the museum is the first machine that ever ran a MESA instruction. And MESA was the language of Xerox and the CPU architecture that drove the entire Xerox line. And in the, in the machine at the Vision Bar, there's a 3 gigabit Ethernet implementation. And they weren't sure if they were going to go 3 or 10. So it's kind of interesting. But the STAR was actually a pretty profound system. Uh, here's where it embodies and doesn't embody some of uh, Engelbart's original ideas. Uh, you can actually see in touch and hold and feel this at Don Woodward's table out there. But the, one of the things, uh, this is the mouse. That's actually a beautiful mouse design, some optical mouse. And it, when you, one of the things, you know, the QWERTY keyboard we got stuck with, well, mouse, mice are all done wrong. You know, most of you know that. In the Xerox mouse, and I believe the original concept of the mouse, if you look at how it's laid out, you have the mouse today has the roller ball back here, kind of under your palm. Um, the mouse in the concept that far been, I think, earlier labs, the pickup, which in this case is optical, is right under your fingertip, it's designed so that as you're moving it, you mentally connect the fingertip with the cursor. And if you use it, it's a very subtle thing, but it's actually quite important. When you use the mouse today, you're sort of mentally connecting. Um, it's like moving a bar of soap. But it doesn't connect you with your fingertip. Your finger is sort of a thing out there that doesn't click. And it was a mistake that was made, frankly, when, say, Apple and others, Microsoft designed their mouse. They really didn't think it through. They really didn't consider what they were losing by that. Um, when you use a stylus, uh, like a Wacom tablet or whatever, you get that finger thing back where it's like, yeah, wow, it's like a little tactile, friendly thing. But if you lose it with the mouse bar, so. On the left, uh, one of the things that was done on the keyboard was, again, putting uh, direct functions. This 
is almost like the Florida keyboard, almost like the key stack. You've got really copy, move properties for objects, things like that, right on the keyboard. So they're assuming, you know, why should you have to control D to all text? You do it all the time. Why should we have why should we have keyboard function? And all the Xerox workstations, the 816 and the others, always had that uh, that idea of coding really commonly used things into a tactile interface rather than leaving it as a, a command set. So, okay, if you go to the interface, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, so this was under development for, I guess, 78, 79 through 81. Various now on Alto, and then as the star cell A10 was built, they would you know, port the machine back and forth. The hardware was constantly changing underneath the star. And so as they were writing the OS, the hardware was changing. It was, it was really difficult. It was a really huge project. And you've got, you know, a very, very clean, beautiful concept of the desktop. I can, you know, pick this folder. I can hit my props key and get the properties of the of, of, of the object. This is a case of file, file folder. And I have coding when something is open or not. Um, a little kind of micro coding. You see these these small icons here tell you which services that are under, underneath. This, I think, is the domain OSPU. Uh, God would be the expert on all of this, but uh, really quite a, a wonderful system. And it failed. Uh, well, it was the biggest customer for it was Xerox. I mean, until the mid 90s, Xerox, these things were everywhere. And then in about 96, they took the hammer and they just destroyed and crushed and destroyed untold number of these things. Uh, the CIA used them, the government used them, the early print service bureaus, everything, you know. Many of you in this room probably probably worked on them. Underneath this was a, a parallel operating system and the next to use our development environment was another parallel world, which is a development environment. But the, the salient thing about the star, here's this one of uh, the 685s, which is a successful workstation to the star, uh, booting up at the Digimark or getting the same booting. It's very mischievous power supply that trips certain you know dips and really Power supplies are a nightmare on these things, actually. Um, but the thing that was interesting is that here you have in 1981 82, you live in the world of today. I mean, anybody who's working at environment has documents and a link, you can open up a printer in another location in Paris and put a document on it and it go out to print in Paris. I mean, it was, it was the future and it was sort of just taken for granted. And the rest of the world was, had to reinvent and reinvent, reinvent for the 20 years to get up to this. And it was all here. Uh, many reasons why this, this star and the 685 are without fail. I mean, you know, they're beautiful systems, they cost a lot of money. Um, tens of you know, thousands of dollars, or ten thousand, twelve thousand, thirteen thousand dollars a seat. They, they were out of touch with the real boom that was going on first in computing the spreadsheet and all those things that were kind of falling up. They were a, a kind of con whole conceived system that didn't allow. A lot of kind of chaos and randomness of invention. I mean, most of the software is written by Xerox <coughs> and over time written by other people. But um, so it was the idea of, you know, if, if a committee designed a really great computing system, this would be it. But those things don't generally, generally in the ecology of technology, they fail. So in the meantime, while that was going on, everybody was got this whole gooey idea of, oh, let's get some windows going, some busy on, it's one of the first things, the rumor has it that it drove Microsoft to, to work on Windows. But Windows, but Microsoft had a star that they bought, and it's been a lot of budget for them at that time. They had one running and they were looking at that, and they were just looking at that. And then we go on to the Lisa interface, um, which is really cool, actually, if you run a Lisa, it's really got a different feel to it. And one of the interesting things that on the Mac, one of the very un Macintosh like things is the calculator, the little rounded corner calculator. If you see that, it's like, it's kind of an odd ball. It actually comes from here. Uh, and it was just transposed very little Mac like interface. And it's still sort of there. It's interesting to see these vestiges. And Lisa failed for the same reasons in the sense that the star was expensive and it, it, it had limited functionality. It was Somewhat slow, and you're trying to, what you're trying to do with the system with that processor and um, you know, hard drive is not necessarily the fastest. And of course, again, was the world ready for such a thing? Probably not. Was, was there 
um, spreadsheet software from Lisa in 83? There was, yeah, Lisa okay. Office had a lot of Was it a, with, were they ahead with, with, um, with spreadsheet software? Was that the first? No, I was in Calculus by 79, I guess. I think everyone had a spreadsheet after they saw it. But you couldn't look at the web. I don't know if the Xerox. Xerox is part of the Xerox. Xerox has a spreadsheet um, that's part of Star. There's a copy that ran on the Apple II in 1978 and 1979. Um, so that's what it was. Now we move on to the Macintosh. You know, here it is. Try it again. Try it again. Fails. Try again. Try again. Small, tiny little package. Um, like, like the Mac, of course, it was a rush job. You know, the Mac OS was not very multitasking like the Lisa was. It, it was kind of a hack. It was like, oh my god, we got to get a small machine, we got to do something. Because this Lisa thing isn't really going to go anywhere. Steve was panicked and people were panicked. And so, but they got it out and uh, did this package. And of course, it languished in the market for about a year, year and a half until a fateful meeting between. John and I talked to Ashley, you can hear more about it later in the event of your history we see it coming up in a few couple of weeks. Uh, an event that's pretty profound. Canon had this wonderful small laser printing engine, and they realized that the proof printer market, not necessarily the primary printer market, the proof printer market for, for uh, publishing was a big deal. I mean, if you would own the electronic or something like that, or in my case, some people were kind of a half million dollar Xerox 9700. You have to go and stand there and type in your document in the language and proof it out on the very machine you're trying to do production on. Or if you're proof printing on a scale on a line electronic or something like that, that's really expensive. You know, it takes you three hours and it costs you hundreds of dollars to you know, see that you made a mistake. So, in a sense, the, the desktop publishing business, and people forget about this, it wasn't about producing this. It was a free proof printing, it was a free printing revolution rather than you know you produce the end, end product right on the desktop device. You didn't. And this meeting, and all the elements were there. You had Geshe and Warnock who had left Park and a final meeting between Peter McCulloch and John Warnock. Peter McCulloch, the founder of Park, and said, Well, actually, this is a very, very interesting story I heard from Bob Flagel, which was uh, ultimate incredible frustration as the 70s. Concluded, and uh, you know, I don't know how much mythology this is, but I remember Charles Bob telling me this 10 years ago. There's this meeting in which uh, Peter McCall, the CEO of Xerox, had been gone around the park again and seen all the universities and all that. He'd been there many times, and I think John or somebody or Bob asked him, Gee, you know, Peter, what really impresses you when you come to the park? They never quite got any output from Xerox. They would send memos and they would get answers. They would show that the alpha was a real day in Florida and they would never get the answers. And, and Peter said something that goes back to something Doug Engelhardt said. Uh, we had a sort of brainstorm around this a few years ago. Peter said, You know what the most amazing thing that surprises me coming to the park is seeing all these men. <laughs> and then they, they would fake off. It's a social cultural thing. It's not a big thing. He's not seeing what's on the screen. It's just this glowing thing. He's watching the social cultural change, organizational change of all these men typing. These men were not like workers. And they don't crack it. You know, with them. And at one point, John was getting frustrated with the uptake of postscript or inner press, press ideas that Xerox could define the language for documents because, of course, they're supposed to come with an architecture for information. And Peter McCall turned to John and said, well, you can verify this with John in a couple of weeks. He said, John, Xerox is just a tough place to get stuff like this done. If you're so passionate about it, why don't you go out and start your own company? <laughs> <laughs> so, for a job, I'm joking. So, these guys are out there, post script, sort of derivative of the work after the press and the press. And uh, then they had this meeting with Steve Job, who had this, this Canon engine. Just had a 68,000 processor, just barely good enough to be a rip to rip, to rip through PostScript or some language and produce a document, just barely good enough. And you have a Mac, and the Mac needed to be connected to something other than this terrible laser writer, and or whatever it was, and uh, to, to actually do something because the Mac didn't do much for you. And they made the alliance, and Steve stopped an internal project and went completely with. With, uh, with Adobe, and boy, it just exploded. One of 
great things that has happened. It produced the platform on which the web is based because desktop publishing, the web is desktop publishing mark two. It's when you, because like people got used to laying out documents and kind of bring them up and down, and the web sort of linked them together. So, in a sense, that was the preparation for the web. So, here we have the ill fated, but we'll love the down to DS. The Waz came back to Apple and, like, you know, his beloved Apple II needed a little bit of an upgrade. Waz's whole idea was openness. You know, the first Mac from the job was closed and used a special tool to open it before you your warranty. And there's a, a tool we have in the museum called the Mac Cracker that you can crack the case open. It's like, oh, it's perfect, close, don't touch it. And John and Waziak was, hey, Apple II GS, why don't look at all those slots? And, Gee, it runs Apple II software too. And it, and it has a GUI. Well, kind of lower res GUI, and it, it, it got killed. But this is kind of a, an interesting thing people don't know about. Uh, the, the Apple II had a GUI like a little bit like the Mac. You could play your Apple II games at double speed on that thing. You could. Wow. <laughs> and there's still quite an active Apple II GS uh, user community on it. Here's, you know, I, I was at IBM when they were trying to do. Top view, which is like horrifically bad stuff. No, no need to go. They're going through all the different things. Young people love this. <laughs> yeah, my father uh, word uh, word perfect. I mean, for him, he, he has the site problems and everything. He cranks on word perfect. When he got on the map, it's like, oh my god, I have to move this cubicle cursor and I have to look. I do all these steps and you know, edit the document that were perfect. I had it coded in my brain. It was like wired in. I knew the keystroke. I could write the whole book. And now he's saddled with a gooey and he hates it. Anyway. So what else was going on? Well, 1985, you know, this was Tyler as a love act killer. It was digital research gem who of course lost the operating system world in the PC, but still had some kick in them. And they created Jam, Graphical Environment Manager. And this was, you know, some pretty fair things were done on this. Ventura Publisher, which was really kicked butt for a few years, was on this. And uh, I wrote a whole environment on top of this, which was this. So basically, we, we had this mission at our little tiny company called Elixir to get, we had Xerox, big, big iron laser printers, big iron workstations. They didn't talk to each other. <laughs> you know, if you wanted to get a, an interpress document on star 65 beam point onto a laser printer, then you could. You could never put together the thing with but uh put about a five minute out, and you needed 120 pages a minute. You were printing building. You didn't care about it. it was a beautiful document. You just wanted to get your building printed. And on the end of this machine was a Stapler folder mutilator machine that the system was 150 feet long and staple folded and mutilated your bill. And you didn't want, you know, this whole beautiful practice thing. You wanted to get the data off the mainframe onto a template and out as fast as possible. Your HTT is getting 40 million of these a month or 50 million bills a month. So, production environment. So, what did the customers do? They had the Xerox 9700 laser printer. Given to them the most beautiful monitor that had this fantastic 120 page of minute 300 dots print, really good print. It was revolutionizing junk mail, was revolutionizing <laughs> provider directories and government tax credit. They love these things, but Xerox gave them no interface. The company that was inventing interface was like, well, you could buy our workstation, but I don't think. But what we'll use is the engineering test language that there's some kind of little published brochure about called Metacode. It's like 13 codes. It's a, Go over a tick, go off a tick, change a font, you know, like 13 commands, and we'll do everything that. This sounds like HTML. It's like they squeeze through, and Metco was fast because it was talking to the firmware directly, and so they loved that. So all these hacked languages were developed to talk to Metco and compile to Metco, like totally a hack. And so we were this struggling company that uh, basically solved the problem for them. This is what I wrote it was don't try this at home. Please. <laughs> I don't like, I mean, it was a uh, oral and C, then turbo C, which really helped us. No debugging environment, no nothing. It was about 300,000 lines of C. I wrote libraries to emulate, to basically recreate the star environment on, on a 640k machine. And 
applications that come from documents are an image editor that load, could load four megabyte images because that's what Caterpillar Tractor needs to do for all their documents is parts manuals and things. This is the multi user version of it. You're logging to account, sure, here. And this is actually what we ended up doing in the end with the Xerox DocuTech. This is 1990 when this, was just before this was ported to, to uh, Windows. And, and I moved to Czechoslovakia and hired 55 people to do that. <laughs> Another story. Um, anyway, you could actually start with a Ventura Publisher document. You could go through to this thing, which sucked main, mainframe data in, merge it with this, and drive this enormous, massive thing called a DocuTech, and set it up in your account, and your converter scanner. You, anyone, you guys know Star, I mean, there's the trash bin. Uh, you could drag and drop. I, I, I took stuff from the Mac that drag and drop because the stars of things that didn't have it. Uh, it had a kind of a select an, an icon object, go into copy mode. You have a little cursor that tells you you're about to have something you can, you can copy, you click and you put it down. There's no drag and drop. So I implemented that. And the pull downs and everything, and all from scratch. And they sold the of them. Anyway, at about the same time. <laughs> <laughs> As all this was happening, you know, Bill Gates said, graphical interfaces, it's going to be the future. You know, it's, it's like nothing else was going on, uh, which they're still saying. Here's the MS DOS executive, which was completely underwhelming. Here's the team. And we have this running on an ATT two floppy system. It's really with the original Microsoft mouse with a steel wall on the wrong place. And there's pink, and then that's the best thing about. Windows 1.0. <laughs> and really, it crashes. It's easy to crash this. It, it, it boots off one floppy, hits the data from the other, comes up on the screen, and then crashes. And then changes the machine. It's just incredible. Um, anyway, so what else is going on? Well, everyone had the GUI, had the, the, the sort of GUI passion, had the GUI disease. And so here's GEOS, and I really admire these guys. These guys said, look, we don't care about the platform, we're going to bring the desktop in for everything. So you can get Geo's desktop stuff on the Power 64 on the 128K, Apple, just about everything on, on early DOS machines. So just give us the desktop. It's like a cross platform. It's just amazing. There were a lot of other reviewing systems around. I'm missing a lot. You guys are probably, uh, you can have it in your experience. Um, Commodore Amiga, sort of. The, the entry port to the great video toaster, a whole other line which is still going going strong in some circles. And here's Microsoft's next attempt, Windows 286 and 386, and there really wasn't much difference between them. But actually, people forget that in, in 88, 89, Windows 286, 386 started to kick butt because PageMaker, which was a huge success on the Mac, was ported and actually worked. Under Windows 2, it actually functioned. And people said, this can work. Maybe something can actually work in Windows. And here we have, we have some of the audience, uh, Bob Glass, who worked on System 7. Was that 1990 or? I got it wrong. started in 89. 89. So System 7, you know, you think of the, the, the Mac uh, OS, you know, the first one, and this was the most significant upgrade, I think, until 10, really. This was a big jump. You look at the old car and all kinds of great stuff that happens in seven. And there's the, the famous Sosumi song. <laughs> well, we'll talk that story later. Um, okay, and at the same time, you know, Microsoft was in bed with its original sponsor, its original big daddy, the bear, or what is it, Steve Baller talks about riding the bear with IBM. And they were like being paid by IBM to write OS2 that would then put them out of the operating system business. And this is OS2 one point. This is, I remember OS2 one point was just a command line thing. And this was the first graphical treatment of OS2 that was still being written by Microsoft before the big schism that happened just before the Windows 3.0 launch. And so Windows 3.0, you guys all know, uh, the desktop, Windows 3.0, 3.1, one of the salient things about them is they were not desktop. Uh, in a sense, they were not a desktop metaphor. They were, it was a container metaphor. It's true to its name, Windows. 
because Windows 3.0 3.1, when I mean, you had, if you minimize the, the program manager, you see a couple of lifetimes down there, but there's no desktop container. You can like stick stuff on your desktop, but it's, it's not there. So companies like Norton put a commanding desktop out there. So they, they were gave this flexible enough for them to do that. And of course, Windows 95 has all that this this entire line of it because you then had a desktop container. And into the 90s, uh, the hopefuls, uh, as the Windows Pie was rising, was IBM OS 2 war cranked away until I guess it's due sometime later. And they had the VOS, which I met a man named Ben Lodge Dalton uh, four or five years ago. He was he said, Oh, I said, What are you doing? He said, Well, I'm the guy that's doing the entire windowing environment for, for B. And he was describing all these wonderful, because I had done one in this Elixir Xerox stuff. And I just, I, just, I heard him describe, here's how we get the windows to paint really fast and overlapping and everything's just beautiful on the alpha channels and everything. I said, you're probably the last, one of the last human beings to ever do this, to make a desktop OS windowing environment from scratch or something. You know, enjoy it while it lasts. It's been last long. But you know, here's you know, some of their approaches, which is to not have a caption bar that goes all the way across. It takes up real estate with having some tabs. And you know, this is a really clean, powerful system. This is the original B box, which uh, they eventually dumped and, and ported. Apple denied them the access, I think, some legal access to the ROMs, so they ended up having to put this over to the uh, uh, Intel architecture. And I talked to Benoit part way through and he said, okay, hey, hey, we can finally get a, a, a comparison between Intel and PowerPC, because that's PowerPC you know. What's faster? Because you guys wrote an OS for one and you're porting it to the other. And he said it's actually apples and oranges, but in truth, uh, at that time, just like it's 96, 97, Intel architecture was a, a faster performance than the whole PowerPC Macintosh architecture because of the PCI bus and the better bus structure. He said, overall, it's a, it's a better platform than the Mac's because of his direct experience with writing code and both. You can get, you get more performance out of an Intel clone. Really interesting. Well, because that was 97. And today, and I'm sorry I'm skipping Gnome and KDE and everything like that, but it's all in the apples and oranges again. Here we are, you know. Microsoft Bob is back. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of round and nice, and it's like you know, touchy, maybe a little bit like Mac. And here's Aqua, which is has its own critics. You know, there's Alpha Channels, wonderful things of design, sense of few jobs, and people being driven crazy by this uh, expanding thing that was different. You know, there's I was on a team in 1996 to advise Apple on uh, GUI changes for the Mac. And the interesting thing was we kept exhausted of the full Xerox guy. Everybody can imagine 42 items to improve uh, in Coppola and System 8. The improvements that they should make, because the Mac OS, we consider to be kind of stuck in its Mac 128K roots. Um, and they basically threw it back to this. And only, they took three things. They did a kind of a, in System 8, they did a minimized bar. So you're saying the window shade thing just sucks. And, you have to have someone who can dock for any application to have an easy way to switch. And they basically, there was no one at the, at, at the wheel there in the GUI department. And so we sent it to Guy Kawasaki, and the guy said, Wow, this is cool. They actually asked some of my side people to advise them on the graphical interface. This is amazing. <laughs> but I can't publish it. I said, Well, why can't you? Because it suggests that the app, the Mac, is not perfect. <laughs> it's not good that you hate Apple. You're surprised at these. They ask for improvements, but you can't. But you love the Mac. Well, that was the dichotomy of the, of the day. And there's still some of the some of the vestiges of that. Like, for instance, um, well, even under Aqua, and we have we have a, we have a three orders per running Mac OS 0.9 for our product alone. We have, of course, the next cube and everything running next step. And we have, you know, System 10. But you can still only size the window for one corner. If you try to, you know, everybody in the world is, when you have a lot of windows open, you're like, oh, I'm going to size this out, or I want to address this. They want to be different. So you click there and you're dragging the window. So there's, there's only one, it's, it's a really hard target to hit sometimes. So there's, there's still some of the limitations. It's debatable whether having a single menu script 
the menu is not associated with the application, is good or not. I mean, there's a school of thought, but everybody in the world has the, the menu associated with the window where it's relevant to. Because on a Mac, you have got to click on a window and then change and roll the menu and then get the right pull downs. And it's like a several step process. So it's debatable, but it looks great. It's wonderful. So, rolling along here, where are we going from here? Well, we're going to be, we're, we're in a sense, attempting to escape from the chains of the 2D grabber movie. Uh, in 1993, 4, when we were finishing up the port of all this Xerox stuff in Prague, I said, I just had a 2D graphical interface metaphors. I'm just sick of it. I've done it for so long, I've written them, I'm just getting ready to do it. So I said, there's got to be something else going on. And I, and in an American expat cafe in Prague, someone had to be copper wired in 1993. I said, there's something else going on. At least culturally. You know, they're not describing any technology in here, but culture is cool. So I actually left the project. It was pretty much sh uh, shipping at the time. And I moved back, drove a van all over the country, visiting from Sigraf to SF Santa Fe Institute, just saying, okay, what am I going to do? Now, I want to do something that isn't the GUI. I don't want to be locked in that my whole life. I said, ah, what? Wow, text based and virtual communities, they're really powerful. They have no interface at all, practically, and yet people create worlds in these things. And so I went to meet famous mud havens and people who had built them because they were true virtual worlds. And then I established a consortium, a nonprofit consortium, all around the concept of avatars and 3D worlds before there were any. And then they started appearing, and then what we did was simply organize universities, companies that were building these 3D worlds, multi user worlds, into a nonprofit, and we held a conference for them, which we still do every year. And I wrote a book on it, which you can have a copy of it if you want it, but we got a box of them. Um, and it was not the GUI, it was something else. It was social and immersive. There were, instead of just windows and lists and stuff, there was somebody moving around the screen saying, you know, how old are you? <laughs> so I thought, wow, you know, this is different. This is a human face on type of faces. The human being represented through technology directly as fish or whatever avatar game play they have. So I was really fascinated. So that became my next career. At the same time, as I started the Vision Bar collection, I started running into early visions for this. And one of them is this fantastic thing by Rich Today. It's a cartoon book, and I was a cartoonist in this era, and there were lots of cartoon cartoons were kind of representative of meaning. And it was a, a cartoon called Escape, which I thought would be a wonderful little allegory for you. It's the old philosopher saying of this mind curling tale. The young kid gets his S100 kit delivered to uh, to the home. And there's a, there's a big thing on his family slams the door. Now what's going on? So into the 90s, soldering, just doing everything, you know, with his business wonder machine, his alter or whatever he has, and then finally drags the old TV over, and now he's possessed. He can code. <laughs> so what does he code? As if, as if possessed, Arnold throws himself staying at the keyboard day and night, not stopping to eat or sleep. Is that familiar? Now what is he coding? <laughs> and off he goes, dream girl, virtual world, and now we're all almost come to the end of the story, which did you choose to believe? But where could he have gone? Yeah, now he's expired. In the world. And the interesting thing, at the end of this, this is summer of 76, uh, this person, mm -hmm. like Ted Nelson, which we have the Dream Machines and Computer Lib, you can take a look at it. It's got a lot of this nice future thinking idea. It's just another tool. Use it, don't let it use you. <laughs> so, anyway, something. Now, I'm just going to dip through this because this is computer. Well, this kind of is computer history, but Alpha World, City in Cyberspace, it's like the metaverse, there's no crash. Neighborhoods from up. Now, it's, this is starting in 1995. There's 3.5 billion polygons in this one world alone. And this is a wedding happening. I'm just taking the pictures like I always do. This is two people in two different cities getting married. Uh, we did a walk on the moon with Rusty Schweikart uh, in 1999 uh, with students that had built a moon landing area. 
then we do our annual conference, which started in a hotel in, at SF State. Uh, we moved it in, into cyberspace in 1998, and this is a scene from the 1999 conference with 8,000 attendees in 20 hours or so, pretty much. And there's us on screen and avatars and users moving around in the exhibits. And this was under the Millennium Dome, that's the 99 conference. 98 conference, the Abbey Awards ceremony. This is the winning, <laughs> this is the winning avatar. The 98 Abbey's. There's us having a great time. Now, now, this is kind of an interesting. We did, last year we did a parody of Cooper's film. So, so this is no, you don't see any windows and pull downs here, right? It's wonderful. Um, so here we are again. This is a parody of 2001 Space Odyssey, and this is one of the worlds, which was the world where all webcams were. But one of the fun things you could do is you could become like a Bowman and say. You know, now, please don't open the pot bay door cell. Open the pot bay door. And this is just on the window when you're snapping online. Open the pot bay door, bay door cell. And this is all the webcams. This is a field of how it's. And I finally opened the door and all of it come out. And at the end, we did the grand finale. Uh, this is like a huge cluster of monoliths at Jupiter. Everybody's standing down on the monoliths and judging all the avatars. And there's all the. This only shows the closest 50 people, or 600 people here. And then they did the huge dog file at the end. This is the stage, and this is a winning avatar, a turtle named, like I think, Luffy, who won the animal category. And, oops, the party. So, a different user interface, but maybe it's the interface of, of the future uh, in some ways. Uh, we recently, thanks to the efforts of Don Whitburn and others got Maze War running on some of the Xerox workstations that the Digi for the opening we had in July. And Maze War was a multi user 3D game with a eyeball that moved around and a little hidden line algorithm. Maze was a heart pounding game. So the Xerox people described going from the star environment of, oh, I'm doing a document. You know, I will have a be document. And then <laughs> open up the window for Maze War, like the heart's pounding. Like, like, oh, yeah, I don't see me. Quick, you know, duck, duck back here. And we're playing this. Original of the Alto. It was actually designed for Richard here at Ames. It went various places and it went on the Alto about visual star. And I think it ended up on the next and things like that. We're doing a full retrospective on Maze War. And at Sigma 2004, it's planned that we're going to have a huge audience interactive experience where, you know, we've had with the Lauren and Rachel Carver, who were talking about this. We stated the Pong thing where 5,000 people play Pong. One would throw the other of these paddles, saying up, 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 and it actually worked. And they were playing five like thousands of people. But uh, we've been trying to have maze for so that you can have so that all these newbies, all these people can see which was the first original multi-user 3D world and bring that back back from history into their lives. Like, oh this is what's the original. But what they want to do is we'll start playing on the old maze war, and we'll be running under windows under the old view for windows, so we'll be running relatively fast and stably. And then what we're gonna do is more. The old black and white maze door into a color one. And it's going to be like Dorothy going from Kansas to Oz. Like, it's the same game, but the eyeballs will bounce on the wall. You know, Nvidia or whatever. It was so it would be like Maze War 2004, probably exactly 30 years after it was running. Also. So I want to thank, and I hope I haven't missed anybody, but some of these folks that have. Done stuff that are in this presentation to help us get systems running to uh, do some research for, for this little job through the GUI land. And if you want to visit us, uh, we're doing a, a tour at 2.30 um, tomorrow. Um, and you have to kind of carpool. And I'll give out maps and follow me. And, and the museum's open. There's about 300 systems on display. Many, many of them will be powered up. Uh, many of them will be. You know, a lot of power there. It's part of the next six months of power and turn all these other things on. The train one will not be powered up despite the trick lights on it that make it look like it's running. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, anyway, uh, if you want to contribute, the main focus of this project is story capture. And uh, because uh, that's the artifact is one thing, but the story is the whole life of it. So if you want to contribute something to the site, um, we now have a lot of. Uh, in a sense, we're giving web space to folks to put their stuff up. 
So we're hosting a lot of people's different computer history sites. You don't have to be on GeoCities that the internet and stuff. And uh, we've got lots of web space. We're doing video, capturing the story, anything to I forget how many pages there are of items, but if you see something that there's something wrong or missing, email us and so we can we have a policy of rapidly updating the site continuously on a daily basis because it's just starting to get a huge momentum. Um, Lee Felsenstein, we're, we're going to be doing a computer uh, reunion for the Solid 20 and things like that. Because they found the page and you know, stuff like that is happening. It's amazing for a project. There's a work for day of Jeff Raskin and some, some things on the Karen mm -hmm. Cat. And that was just a huge list of, of things that we're, on, we're doing all the time. It's all volunteers. You know, it's just passion. And that's it. And then is that time for questions? Yes. Uh, about your uh, uh, GUI, uh, the Commodore 64 built in 1962, uh, Berkeley software, uh, did GEOS for the Commodore. Uh, recent developments are that uh, they have, uh, people have uh, commercially uh, uh, upgraded we, uh, GEOS, a program called Wheels, which allows the, uh, the uh, Commodore 64 to access uh, 16 megabyte memory uh, additions, which are uh, devices that can be plugged into mm -hmm. hard drives, uh, multiple drives, uh, unlimited number of drives, uh, uh, CD-ROM drives, uh, anything that's SCSI. Uh, all of these things can be done now with a, a program called Wheels, which is an upgrade to Geos. And uh, it's it is like commercially being games. produced right now. You can yeah. buy it. It's new and it's being upgraded and and supported. Uh, it's just amazing what you can do with the old Commodore. But the, the fact is that they're still working on the Geos or the uh, GUI well, system for the Commodores great. right now. That's really great. And it probably is 500 games. The program. Uh, <laughs> no, it runs. It runs on the regular. But like, say, you can get a. a, a uh, Super CPU, which is a plug-in memory device that has up to 16. It runs the Commodore 20 times the normal speed, plus has the ability to uh, be expanded up to 16 megabytes of uh, memory, which is active memory, not just RAM storage. So you can actually use it for designing programs and so forth. So it just uh, and you can buy brand new hard drives. Uh, 1.4 megabyte floppy drives and so forth to plug right into the Commodore and just use it just like one of the old 1541 drives. So these are all being produced right now for uh, com uh, computers that's that, that old. Mm -hmm. well, thanks. Well, that, it's, it's good because it reminds you, uh, you know, do we need to have a minimum one gigabyte installation of hard drive space for a graphical shell? It's just kind of amazing how we build the shelves that, that Jordan Moore has created with all those APIs and big layers. And it's good to see things like Geos are continuing to live, live on and show us that as well. So we have any questions here? I'd like to know more about how do we end up in Czechoslovakia? How do we end up in Czechoslovakia? Yeah. That's an interesting project. Well, the, the thing was that. We had, I had done crazy in the A's, I read about 300,000 lines of code, and we had to port it to Windows. And we had to expand it, and we're going to take a huge effort. And my boss had had Czech professors in the 60s. I thought, these people are really smart. And it turns out many of the coffee shops of the old Eastern Bloc were there, especially software and raw operating systems. And the Slovaks was made there. The, 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 the Slovak Max was called the Slovaks. <laughs> they made up a joke, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible because you go to the university and you find all these home built computers that have like LCD displays with two stations that you turn and some of them type of line and you turn it back to the type of line and things that people students have made their own set their own processor and built their operating system in the four year degree program. Or there was one guy on the team who had been part of a stealth project with two system 370s. Smuggled out of Sweden in the 1970s. I don't know if you remember this film, but it was a big industrial espionage case. And those three settings went to Prague. And the guys, this is during the economy, so these guys got permission to go to the bank and force in, in Paris. And they, went, and they were so terrified of getting caught that they simply 
uh, rope in the chair. I mean, taught all the men, there's all this huge men of the two seven instructions and everything wrote them up in their notebooks in absolutely tiny, tiny script because they didn't have, they couldn't carry much back in the country. And they took all the sailing features of the 370 back and they made a copy. They tore one apart, they used one as a control, and they built a replica to be 10 years. And it, and it uh, had a fault tolerant operating system. Fault tolerant because the Bulgarian risk packs would fail all the time. And then when I, we hired this guy, and some of the guys we hired were like, uh, have you ever done any graphical interviews for them? Only in my life. They debunked Windows so much. I mean, we reported all these bugs in Windows 3.0, and Microsoft people were saying, We haven't found this in six months, and you found it. You found it as a message out of order. We were trying to find this for Windows 3.1. These guys found it. You know, maybe. Um, any last questions? I know we're Cutting it at home, cutting it at Boston's time. So, thank you very much.